So hello everyone and uh, welcome to Entrepreneurs Budget Analysis for 2022, the proud moment where, you know, we, this is something that we look for in the beginning. It's like a happy new year for everybody in the business world uh, when the budget is to come out and, you know, we expect SOPs for the industries, we expect so many things that will come to happen. So I think uh, the budget 2022, if you really ask me how it turned out to be, I would say it's a very delicately carved, balanced budget in one sense, uh, you know, taking into view that almost virtually a lot of industries got covered by the budget, which we have not normally seen happening um, in earlier budgets. But at the same time, you know, it's a budget that supports economic recovery. Um, it's sort of that is where, um, you know, it is trying to bring as many industries into in, in its ambit uh, as possible. And that's a good thing. Um, so it's also, I think, um, on overall, it's uh, sort of geared towards creating jobs. It is about boosting manufacturing. It is helping the agricultural economy, the health tech sector, um, skilling, education in India and in infrastructure creation. So I think given all these things happening, we feel that a lot of other sectors will also get to enjoy the benefits that are actually first enjoyed by these industries and therefore going forward, its fruits will be seen in the other industries uh, as well. So we're joined here by Gaurav Singh. Welcome Gaurav. Um, you know, uh, here we are sitting today to see how really the budget will perform for the industry as we go forward. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, Gaurav is the co-founder of uh, JPIN and, um, you know, um, so uh, wonderful to have you here. So, uh, you know, uh, Gaurav, let me ask you by, um, you know, uh, 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 stating that, you know, the budget is, if it is uh, going to cover so many industries, what, what is your overall analysis of the budget before we sort of get a little more uh, into dissecting industry-wise and going uh, deep down into how every industry will benefit that it has touched? What, what is your overall view about the budget? So I think um, <clears throat> what was fundamentally extremely important is to demonstrate an extremely progressive uh, thought process uh, uh, because, you know, we are uh, the top four startup ecosystems uh, and with a, we're poised to be, you know, as our target to be number one economy in the world. That forward thinkingness was, has come out very beautifully um, uh, as an overall view that the whole world is watching because everyone wants to invest into crazy uh, amounts and they want to see if we are heading in the right direction. And I, I don't think they could have done anything better. It is a massive task uh, and uh, which is why they are just making sure that every category, every industry is covered and there is a structure that is being put around it uh, so that it can grow and scale. So I, I am quite, quite happy with uh, how it's progressed. So what, what would you think, uh, who would be the first top five beneficiaries of the budget, particularly eight months? Um, what, what do you think its impact will be? So I think the crypto uh, uh, industry definitely, and I think a lot of the retail investors who have been uh, uh, dabbling with this, uh, just not able to sleep at night, okay, you know, what if it goes, if it's not legal tomorrow. So I think that is a very good uh, stamp to everyone. Uh, of course, the risk is what it is, but it is, it is there. There's huge investment, huge growth happening. Blockchain, you know, the digital rupee, I mean, imagine, right? So, so uh, that also further solidifies uh, the intention around the keyword of blockchain as well. I think then we talk about climate. So climate is the right uh, 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 impact thought process. Uh, the modernization around this uh, is shooting up. Um, again, agri-tech, uh, education. So these are top five, I think, which are the fundamentals and the backbones. And I think they've uh, hit the hammer in the right places. MSME, you know, if I talk about the sixth one, you know, that is shooting up and, and for India to be a 20, 30 trillion ecosystem, MSME will play a very critical role uh, uh, in, in trade and global growth. Uh, and again, you know, this huge enablement on that part. So, so these are, you know, top five, six areas. So, you know, particularly, I mean, if I were to touch upon the MSMEs to at least start with the um, uh, so the custom duties um, uh, is being uh, raised to 20%. So, I mean, you know, particularly the scheme that they have sort of elongated, uh, which, which is the, I think the ESG scheme. So what, what 
think, I mean, from me standpoint, which have already taken a meeting during the, particularly the MSME gets impacted quite a bit. So overall, um, from that perspective, how do you think the budget would really help them? So um, I think what they've done uh, with the ECL uh, GS, um, you know, sort of the, the scheme which is extended by about 50,000 crores, I think it is see good MSMEs only need working capital help. And just when they are struggling, because many of them are at breakaway point, right? And unko utne time ke liye hi kabhi kabhi help chahiye hota hai, right? So either they can, they'll, 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 they'll break it up or they'll disappear. And I think this is where they have uh, understood the pulse and provided that lifeline. Because they are not, you know, if they are continuing to do well, then there is enough right. uh, credit facilities and ecosystems that will continue to support them. So this is the emergency credit line guarantee is is pretty awesome. I think this is what they needed. And I'm, I'm hoping it will be truly welcome. As far as the distribution and access of it is fast, because emergency means uh, quick access, right? It doesn't mean six months. So if that is something that uh, 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 is how it is enabled, then uh, it is spot on for them. Sure. And also, you know, they've um, uh, put aside rupees 2 lakh crores uh, through for um, MSMEs through the CGT SME, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, vertical as well. Now, uh, my, you know, on another level, if I look at it, how do you think, um, I mean, and I, I know that in fintech, uh, particularly in the SME lending space, we have seen that there is an increase in NPAs. Um, how, how do you think we can address that situation? I mean, obviously, you know, the money can be made available, but the idea is that the money should return also with um, uh, to the banks or to the NBFCs, to SME lending uh, startups. Um, how can we sort of balance that out? I mean, you know, uh, in the times to come. So I think it is by a truly embracing technology. So we invested uh, in a business called Credit Enable, which is focused on the right kind of capital, fast capital for the the right MSMEs. Um, because sometimes, you know, the, the, the reason the capital doesn't come back is because it's too expensive uh, or it comes very late uh, and the business is kind right. of, just, you know, uh, so very fast, quick, something that instead of taking, you know, three to six months, it can happen in a matter of a week. You know, that is all that is needed. Um, I think then uh, again on the, uh, micro lending side, we, we invested in a business called uh, Kashi and the social loan company. Again, their NPAs have not gone up beyond 3.3%. They've generally through COVID, they maintained 2%, but their risk metrics, see, they are not desperate. And when you get into desperate lending, that is where the risks are very high and NPAs will remain high. But if you keep uh, targeting to the right audience with the right kind of risk assessment, you know, uh, a lot of good technology, a lot of risk assessment is definitely trying to cap that. And banks uh, and institutions truly need to embrace these technologies so that uh, overall exposure can stay low. And the lower the exposure overall, the more they lend, right? So, so that is the technology will play a very critical role. Sure. And, you know, I also know that the budget has uh, sort of uh, included VCs and uh, PE funds under the umbrella, you know, just to bring more governance over there. So what do you think its impact is likely to be? I think it's very important because there's a synchronization. Uh, I think where where the overall strategy and direction is heading, I think it allows it will make things easier. I think you know it it in many cases you know is a, a a private sector versus the government. Now what they've tried to do is make it this and that in conjunction. So you know if you see from the Western world, uh, what they have been really really good at is creating a collective of the public and private sectors. So they work in tandem. Uh, and this is a perfect move uh, on the collective uh, uh, of uh, integrating, I think, the thought processes so that everyone evolves at the same time. Uh, uh, and the policies, the uh, uh, where the investment needs to be, what the investment structures need to be, what the where government will co-invest. Uh, if, if private sector, if the PEs, VCs are investing in what are the true support structures that actually mean something that will come from the government. Um, and a lot of those mechanisms will fall very beautifully hand into hand. So this is a very, very good, serious play uh, that the government has put a step forward into. Sure. Uh, Gaurav, I'm going to come back to you. We've also got uh, Bhavjot, uh, who's joined us from clinic. Uh, Bhavjot, uh, I are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, I am. Um, hi, Ritu, how are you? Okay. 
Lovely to <laughs> very well, and it's good to have you here as we're doing this budget review. A lot of things for the health tech industry, as we see, um, you know, particularly the open platform, the national digital health ecosystem that the government is planning to set up. And of course, uh, the first time we've seen a big emphasis on the mental health side also. Uh, yes. which is being uh, raised by the government to see, because obviously it's something in the future that is uh, going to, um, um, you know, we're going to see and hear much more about than we have. Um, so what, what, are, what are your thoughts about it? You know, um, how do you think it's going to improve overall the healthcare system and the health benefit, the health tech sector also? Yeah, I think, Prithu, uh, uh, this budget as, you know, like, uh, the Ayushman Bharat the Digital Health Mission has been getting so much of impetus from the government. I think this budget was just a continuation to that. And uh, just to put things in perspective, right, in India, more than 50% of the prescriptions which are generated today are generated by quacks. So you're talking about uh, doctors who, or like I shouldn't call them doctors, but uh, practitioners who don't even have a legit medical degree, Right. So uh, one of the things I think which was proposed uh, in the in the scheme of thing today was the health registry, right, which brings accountability into the system. You are able to create a registry which will tell you about the medical uh, designations of these practitioners, right. So that is a huge thing which the government is going to inculcate, and I think uh, that is in uh, line with the national digital health mission where you know they are improving the interoperability. So right now there are a lot of diagnostics, medicines being prescribed. There is no intervention on those uh, on medical records. No uh, focus on outcomes. So towards building towards this larger place, right? Like that's where government is now bringing everything together to make sure that there is accountability in outcomes. There is accountability in medical practice, and it's not just uh, uh, something which is just happening randomly. So that each and every diagnostic which is prescribed can be linked to your health ID. Any medical transaction that is happening can be linked to your health ID, right? So I think this is a great move and I think we are all looking forward to the uh, health registry which um, uh, the finance minister spoke about today. And uh, definitely like COVID pandemic, right, we all understand that coming to your second point on the mental health part, right? I mean, uh, no matter what we say or do, the past two years have been very, very taxing for everyone, right? Uh, and I think this whole helpline that the government is setting, and I think Nimhans in Bangalore is the one which is helping them uh, facilitate this uh, helpline, will be very helpful for people, specifically in the missing middle and the lower segments, to come forward and, you know, avail such services. Because unlike the kind of awareness that is there in the top of the pyramid, top of the economic Indian pyramid. But when you talk about the bottom of the economic pyramid and the missing middle, there is still a lot of taboo around mental health. So government coming uh, in the forefront and actually uh, promoting something and making it mainstream is a huge move uh, and is highly appreciated. Sure. Yeah. No. I think um, um, possibly. I think the the shoot or the offshoots uh, in the health tech sector are getting uh, to be seen. And you're right. Um, you know what we are seeing right now in terms of health is only when uh, in pandemic and still everybody is in. But once everybody starts coming out as the pandemic ceases, um, we'll probably see a whole different. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, problems, different kind of uh, health care uh, diseases cropping up, which would then need to be addressed. So I think the government is um, actually forecasting very well on that uh, grounds to see that, you know, what are the likely problems of the future and taking uh, uh, steps to resolve the problem. So thank you very much for joining us, Pavjot. Uh, Saurabh, you want to take it from here? Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. So we, uh, we have uh, Akash here. Uh, Akash, hi, how are you? So your so your first reaction to the budget, Akash, on uh, what has been announced, uh, you know the benefits of which were uh, uh, announced last year in terms of uh, uh, you know promoting this digital payments and all have been continued this year as well. Your thoughts, uh, Akash? We'll have to add it. Yeah, sorry for that. I think two larger takeaways from me is one one the tax rebate extension extension for the startup community as it is. It was supposed to end at March 2022. Now it is extended till March 2023. That is the second is on the 
an entirely digital ecosystem, right? When digital banking, digital literacy. See, today, a lot of people are not able to be part of online mode because they're not digitally literate, right? So we can, so UPI has done a good job. We have more than 40, 42 crore people using UPI, but beyond that, to, to get more people into this ecosystem, we have to make people digitally literate, right? So that, that I'm, you know, focusing on the, on the schemes which government, which finance ministry announced today about setting up digital skilling and education portal, right? That will help us make people more comfortable about the entire you know, digital product. And then we can focus more on digital banking after that, right? Because that is a prerequisite to even start digital banking or digital ecosystem inclusion, financial inclusion. Right. Second, the point around this, you know, interoperability around post office, forcing enforcing post office to focus more on net banking, digital banking, mobile banking. That will also help us to reach out to the people who are not at all comfortable with the entire online solution. Right? They're still very dependent on cash, very much dependent on a human assisting them to do banking or anything on payments. So those initiatives will bring help us bring those new set of people in the fold of financial inclusion. So you don't see it as an as, as a threat because uh, you know one lakh plus post of I mean post offices going uh, you know digital. Uh, Correct. Uh, how, what does it mean for people who uh, for startups who have been operating in that area who've been doing small ticket transactions in rural areas, smaller places. I think startups can do more, right? So today you're also limited depending on the banking population of the country, right? Suppose I'm, I'm you know, extending payment services to them. Right? Tomorrow I can extend investment services to them. I can extend loan services to them. See, India as a country doesn't have a very large active banking population, right? I mean, we as a country are not aware of investment opportunities that we have, right? And that is one reason of, you know, a lot of money is not reaching to what I think Gaurav mentioned about, you know, low funding for MSMEs and all, right? So investment is the first step. Right, through which we can bring a lot of money inflow to the people who need to the MSMEs we need, a small startup we need. And that can come from citizens or anyone who's a banking account to be aware about investment opportunities they have. Right, So that is the cycle which we can create. Digital banking is the first step. Second is digitally, you know, like telling them or making them literate about opportunities which they can avail. Right? They can start investment, they can start wealth management, and they can bring the money back in the ecosystem through which others can benefit. Right? So... Okay. All right. Great. Uh, you know, I'll, 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 we'll come, uh, we'll go to Nikhil. Nikhil is, uh, Nikhil is from Zulu. Uh, Nikhil, hi. Uh, uh, hi, so, uh, hi. So, you know, hospitality was one sector which needed, you know, the, they needed really great support. Uh, do you think that has been given to that sector? Uh, I think additional 50,000 crore, the emergency credit line, uh, it's obviously going to help. But perhaps the sector uh, needed more. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that the initiatives are not helpful. They are. Uh, but given the pain, uh, imagine if your market just vanishes. Uh, it's like you're selling cars and there is nobody who's driving car anymore for two years. Uh, <laughs> this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, how do you say, impact is, is not heard of and unprecedented. So it, it perhaps uh, needed more, uh, but... Uh, explain what, what was needed for it in case you can elaborate. Uh, in terms of more clarity on people who are already gotten into existing NPAs, like a lot of uh, hotel owners, hospitality owners. Now there's no customer for the last two years. They've gotten into NPAs. Uh, then what do they do? Who do they go to? Do they have time for before auctions start? Or will, we, will banks to give them some more time for recovery? And post-recovery, what's really... So, uh, so that's NPA, that's one, people who are already struggling, people who are at the brink of struggle, uh, can they borrow more? Can, so there is, I think uh, it needed a little more depth onto how exactly uh, uh, these various cohorts of suffering uh, are gonna be assaged. Uh, and, and they are not, there's not one cohort, it is a multiple cohorts, different people uh, who have different levels of pains. Uh, so that's one, but yeah, as I said, uh, so as I said, uh, something is always better than nothing. And in that sense, uh, I would say that as a, as, as a, as a group, uh, I think the industry is grateful to the fact that there is something, um, but yeah, uh, because we are close to this industry, right? So we can see the pain that there is, uh, and that pain is non-trivial. Uh, it, as I gave you that analogy of cars vanishing, it is almost exactly like that. Just everything vanished. And I, although it looks like it's coming back in two months, uh, 
so that uh, the pain is not doesn't look like a pain which is going to continue for long but still uh, more support in terms of existing pain would have been helpful because i doubt people with existing npas would be able to afford these loans further so what about people who are already in pain this new lending can help in the borderline cases but what about people who have already gone down under i think that maybe in implementation it will come more light will be shared uh, but if it is shared it will be helpful great nikhil uh, uh, nikhil will come back to you uh, shab sundar has joined us from dehat uh, so if you if you want to talk about it right thank you everyone so i think uh, no from so they had is an agri tech company and from agri tech perspective and from a startups perspective this was a, a really good budget you know for agri tech at least it was a budget it was a watershed budget i would say right because there had been a lot of things which had been mentioned which will, which is going to promote overall use of technology in this sector right so <clears throat> our initial level reaction on this is pretty pretty enthusiastic right uh, for example there is a <clears throat> there are mentions about how to basically promote use of drones for multiple uh, purposes in agri especially at the crop level at the farm level right so for example like say assessment of crop crop status or digitization of land records spraying all these are use cases which as startups we had been exploring for quite some time and with government intervention i think we would we should be able to basically make it uh, scalable and sustainable so this is this is quite welcome uh, on that front right um, also on say agritech startup companies uh, who are engaged in uh, basically delivering advisory solutions to farmers right they will be supported by the government so basically uh, in terms of technology um, acceleration right so you know, text, basically digitization of agriculture per se right so and the entities which are engaged in that they will be supported that is again a quite happy um, outcome of this budget for us uh, there had been a lot of conversations around nabard further supporting agriculture startups agri tech startups and uh, also making them part of various uh, plans under them right so again which is uh, which had been happening but a clear guideline from government had always been good right um i was also very surprised that government mentioning a lot of other initiatives that agritech companies have taken right so um, you know startups which are supporting fpos which are supporting farm rental uh, rental kind of services mechan that that is going to promote uh, basically mechanization other it based supports that you know farmers are getting so all of these and covering all of these things under you know financing under nabard was quite welcome right so i would say that uh, there have been there, there are other things also which are uh, welcome and i uh, know uh, there are regular things like extended credit or you know pro allocating say more money and to farmers and msp so all these things are i would say what is getting continued but there had been a lot of uh, talking points for us um, in this budget as far as say agri tech or technology in agriculture is concerned i also think that uh, the government has put a emphasis on uh, educating farmers and you know uh, through the uh, uh, you know agricultural universities and also i think they want the uh, the, the farmers also to now get more uh, engaged in terms of how they can uh, on them uh, on their own can uh, help themselves right right so that's what so providing education to farmers okay through use of technology i think had been one of the key aspect that had been <coughs> right uh, we see that you know as there is there are going to be deeper penetration of technology uh, dissemination of knowledge to farmers can you know so there can be innovative and more in inventive way to find this course right so lot of knowledge that is there with agricultural universities in this country and other other such government institutions like krishi vigyan kendra you know, there are so many different institutions right there is definitely there are definitely ways to link them with farmers and basically customizing that knowledge base as per the requirement of farmers right and with lot of agri tech companies exploring this exploring this field a government intervention is definitely going to make sense definitely going to make a difference on how knowledge is reaching out to farmers okay. uh, thank you sham uh, for joining us today and uh, pritu 
uh, we have uh, Sahil here, so maybe you can. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Saurabh. Hi, Sahil. Wonderful to have you here with us. And uh, what a pro budget for the logistics sector, I must say. You know, I've never seen uh, the government being so pro to having a bigger, and not just to the logistics sector, but also to the enablement of the logistics sector. So on one side, we have a national highway network uh, to be expanded by 25,000 kilometers. And then, of course, rupees 20,000 crores, which has been allocated towards that. But also at the same time, you know, there is... Um, the fact that we are uh, the creation of the unified uh, logistics platform and development of 100 new cargo terminals. I, I see that there is a, such a large play that is going to be there for the logistics sector. And overall, it shows the sentiment of the government towards um, you know, amplifying e-commerce, amplifying D2C um, uh, through, this, uh, through these particular enablements. Um, so what is your take on it? You know, how, how do you see this, um, the current budget um, and probably, of course, new variations uh, to this, these policies will also come in the days to come. So what, what is your take on it? Uh, no, thanks a lot, Ritu, Saurabh, for uh, having me and great listening to other people sort of comment on the budget. And, um, uh, you know, as so Shiprocket is focused on helping the long tail SMBs and D2C brands ship better, ship faster and ship cheaper. Um, and we actually do it like in like a data exchange, right? We don't actually get into the actual supply chain. We do it by connecting with existing players within the supply chain to make it possible. Um, so in some ways it was music to our ears, you know, just to understand. And we know there's been a framework the government's been working on for some time. Uh, so it was really great to hear that it was sort of being formalized now. Um, the fact that, you know, the Gati Shakti project where uh, the government wants to really, you know, invest behind the growth engines of the economy, whether it is B2B trade or B2C. You know, we've seen this play out in China, you know, a few years ago, as well as the US, where road transportation ultimately is the most cost effective way of uh, moving goods or rail transportation for that matter. So uh, really, really pleased to see uh, such a big focus area within the budget. I think the fact that there, there's now more inclusive digitization schemes, uh, the fact that there's more MSME credit uh, you know, expectation as well, should also boost the small businesses from being able to go online, uh, get payments, you know, in a better fashion compared to a cash on delivery mechanism as there's more digital adoption as well. So overall, I think uh, from a, a MSME, SME, commerce, logistics, from that kind of lens, you know, uh, uh, very happy to see the focus of the government on this. I think in many ways, it's a, it's a, it's a big one, you know, uh, uh, from our perspective. Sure. And overall, I mean, you know, what are the changes? What are the new trends that you see emerging in the uh, logistics side? Uh, I mean, you know, I know that quick commerce is certainly um, something that to look forward in 2022. It's just started probably in its uh, real glory in 22 beginning. Uh, so what what uh, amplifications do you expect to see over there? See, I think the, the word Gati Shakti, which is speed of power, uh, I mean, power of speed kind of says it, right? And while I know it's aimed towards sort of uh, national uh, extension of the roads and making things move faster, it's a, it shows that that's where the uh, intent of the government is to make things easier. You know, while the budget doesn't directly address uh, quick commerce as such, uh, but from an intent perspective, definitely we think it's a, it's a great move. And um, from a trends perspective, there's no question about it. You know, uh, 10 years ago, you wouldn't buy anything online, right? Five years ago, you wouldn't buy clothes online. Uh, you wouldn't, then three years ago, you wouldn't expect them to come tomorrow. And two years from now, you wouldn't expect them to come two hours later, right? So, so I think it's a matter of uh, consumer behavior, consumer preference, and it's, it's going to happen. Like, there's no question about it. Absolutely. So Gaurav, let me ask you to jump in. I mean, you know, we've now seen so many different forms of e-commerce and quick commerce being the, the more younger baby in the, uh, so to say, Tao. So what, what as an investor, how are you looking um, at making investments on the quick commerce side? So I think, uh, in all honesty, we're looking to truly invest, you know, sort of several billion um, uh, into this space. Uh, so people, I think the mindset, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, Sahil very beautifully articulated, I think we weren't expecting. And now it's become um, a want, right? So you want to have it the same day, you want to have it a few hours, you know, Zepto and, and others, uh, you know, Blinkit, 10 minutes, right? So you know what you want. So it is truly integrating into our lives. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, this is the way. And it is, you know, when humans... You know, or when one asks people, when we start getting used to something good, it is very hard for us to unwind and go back, 
right yeah. so it there's only one way and i think uh, uh, of course you know uh, that is where we uh, will be investing uh, more and more i think ecosystems and again the what i uh, would talk about is the collective strength and it is where the collective strength will make this faster ecosystem uh, more efficient so what i say is that you know th though we will be investing you know a, a huge uh, amounts um it is important that different ecosystems uh, you know ship rocket and other kind of players start to open up uh, to each other and just say how we can cross leverage the ecosystems to truly provide customers the the benefit and grow rather than each trying to do the same thing right you know we can all become you know 10 billion businesses each of us if we do it together rather than trying to do the same thing against each other yeah well sweat it out as they say um so i also see that yagnesh is here uh, from 100 vc hi yagnesh wonderful to have you here with us as we were discussing that logistics is a big focus uh, on the government side so what what particularly do you see um, in from a, as a investor side uh, are you looking at logistics and particularly as i was talking about quick commerce being um, you know the the new the new e-commerce uh, that we are seeing emerging so how are you betting on it thank you for having me uh, am i audible enough uh, yes we can hear you sure good to see you know certain people on the panel gorav i've met him before so yeah i mean uh, just pleased to see the budget there's a lot of uh, actually a lot of tailwinds that will come from this budget uh, which are you know infra led etc i mean those they're going to benefit larger companies but remember that larger companies are highly and more dependent on startups as we go along Uh, so i think there's a huge push i would feel an indirect push rather i mean if you really see the startup incentives there is hardly anything to talk about uh, to be honest i mean we wanted esop taxation stuff which also affects a lot of people uh, big ask never got met so i hope my ship rocket guys also have issued esops and they must be hoping that you know this could get exempt uh, at least at the exercise level so i think that's a little bit way off i think it will come through uh, because the pressure is very high on the you know finance ministry as well as the government and it's a very clear ask i mean it's very fair so i think it's a matter of time one is that and i think secondly we had this whole thing about tax rates being very fair to you know unlisted as well as listed so that didn't happen uh, we would have loved to see that happen so i think it's good for the investors if that would have been the case i mean the period could be different and one could you know keep the period longer for startups and unlisted uh, vis-a-vis listed which is fair <laughs> but at least the rates should have been rationalized there's some recourse in terms of the surcharge now being you know capped at uh, whatever percentage but i mean that's a small thing uh, as compared to had the rates been similar so those are the things but i think on the positive side a lot of stuff that probably people won't really realize uh, right now uh, these are things that i uh, i feel that you know for this to take shape probably 2 3 years later you will see the impact of what the budget is right now so i think a lot of positives here uh, the momentum is going to continue i mean this is not uh, any budget cannot stop or uh, you know uh, do anything anything to the startup investment pace that we have seen last year i mean 30 billion plus coming into the startup ecosystem uh this is only going to grow up right because if you see the world i um, mean in india is the probably the the lowest hanging fruit and everybody realizes that so it's a no brainer i mean i don't need to say this in more words i mean everybody understands that and it's it's now on an autopilot and a lot of efforts of the government over the past 5 6 budgets i think that is what has paid off and um but yeah just to talk about the logistics space Uh, we've invested a few uh, companies in that, and uh, uh, I was just talking to Tanmay Sahil uh, about uh, Ship Rocket's initiatives with the startups, and glad to know that a lot of corporates are now working closely with startups to uh, disrupt some of these things. And you know, these are the things that you know uh, we we at at Hundred X we work with very early stage bootstrap founders. These guys have dynamic ideas, but not the capital they need. <laughs> um capital as well as a little bit of mentoring to kind of take it to the next level so i am seeing a lot of uh, you know offshoots which will be very positive you know so we are we are we are very gungo i mean we made about 50 investments last year alone uh, and hope to double it 
uh, yeah. hopefully we can. So I think that pace is unabated. Maybe seeing enough startups uh, uh, should get funded, uh, will get funded. So yeah, I mean, that's a little bit on my side. Sure, thanks, Ignesh. And I also see Millets getting a very special place in the budget uh, this time. So hopefully we're going to see a lot of more B2C startups in the Millet space. Um, Sahil, are you betting on that? Um, I'll be honest, you know, there's, you can, you name the space and there is, there is opportunity because I think that's more of a behavior shift, you know, today's population, everything is personalized, you know, your Facebook feed, your LinkedIn feed, your email, why shouldn't your products be personalized? I think that's the broad reason why D2C is just, I think it's going to be amazing the next few years. So why not millets, right? I mean, uh, sure. Saurabh, over to you. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, first, uh, let me thank, uh, we have more guests uh, coming in. So, uh, uh, Gaurav, thank you for joining us. I know uh, we just asked 30 minutes of this, so I think we've already exceeded that time. So, thank you for joining us today, and uh, good to hear your uh, uh, views. Uh, Bhavjot, anything uh, final, uh, finally to uh, sign off uh, uh, you know, from your side? Yeah. So, no, I think there was uh, this question on the chat just I was going through, right? Like, uh, considering time. yeah, considering that uh, it was a pandemic, it has been pandemic year for two years. If I have to give you like absolute numbers, last year budget allocation towards healthcare was around 86,000 crores. And this year budget allocation towards healthcare was 86,200 crores. So it's up only by 200 crores, right? Which is like, but the 0.2% increase. So uh, it is definitely not in line with what we had expected to be very fair and honest. See, in India today, most of the expenses are out of pocket, right? 80% of the expenses are out of pocket and they're still uh, not covered in ATD or ATC benefits. Uh, and there is no provision for a managed, for, uh, uh, you know, exemption of tax in like a managed care kind of a model. Plus there was a lot of... Uh, uh, expectation on uh, the healthcare infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, like pushing in more, pumping in more money there. One thing which definitely is good and is positive is uh, they have intensified the manpower upskilling, right, for uh, medical staff and uh, medical entrants. Because right now, uh, no matter what we say, there is a huge shortage of manpower when it comes to supply, a good, decent quality supply. So I would say that definitely this was a right push when you talk about uh, uh, you know your universal accessibility and national digital health mission etc but uh, i would say that healthcare industry would expect a lot more uh, in importance or uh, you know like uh, giving uh, been given some more budget allocation in the coming days and of course easing the is getting more tax benefits on out of pocket expenses as well so yeah these are my uh, final thoughts thank you Thank you so much, Bhavjit, for joining us here. It has been uh, you know, a pleasure to have you. And I know it is a shocker for all of us that healthcare hasn't been really addressed the way we were expecting as well, but we'll let you go. We have Saransh here to talk more about the healthcare. Uh, Saransh, we were expecting maybe ATD will get more exemptions and all. Nothing happened. So uh, so what, what's, your, what's your take? Yeah, so, uh, you know, so, so I run Nova Benefits. We are an employee wellness platform centered around health insurance. I think just, you know, picking up from Bob Jodh's point, uh, I, I think I was just doing rough, uh, the math behind the number. We're talking about less than 0.5% of the GDP being allocated to uh, healthcare in a post-pandemic world. So that was definitely surprising. Overall, if I look at the budget, uh, I think uh, while certain sectors definitely, uh, you know, like on logistics, we had some uh, great progress. Overall, it was still muted, no big bang announcements. But it was still progressive in the sense, if as speaking as an entrepreneur in the ecosystem, I think the recognition of mental health uh, that came out strongly for the government of India to kind of recognize mental health and put that at the forefront. Uh, I think Bhavjot mentioned about you know bottom of the pyramid and middle of the pyramid, but even while there's awareness in the uh, you know at, at the upper middle class, middle class level, nobody actually uses it. It's still a taboo. So I think that kind of you know. Uh, the finance minister speaking about it on television definitely helps. Uh, so I think mental health was one piece. 
I think climate change also, I think uh, we, saw, we heard a good progressive announcement there. Uh, the battery in- interoperability was interesting. Energy as a service was interesting. Uh, I think the, you know, on a related point to battery interoperability, and the health register that they announced was a step in the right direction of healthcare interoperability because the data is so fragmented today. Uh, being able to pull that together and uh, uh, kind of make it available to different healthcare providers will improve the access and the quality of outcomes. Uh, so I, I think uh, these were two good initiatives. And then I think the third thing why I thought it was progressive was uh, the recognition of the difference that the PE and VC industry has made. I think it was called out, uh, uh, there was, there's a committee being put forward on how can we, this be encouraged furthermore. Uh, I, I also found it uh, interesting that uh, uh, the finance minister talked about making it easier to shut businesses as well from two years to six months. And I think that needs to be encouraged, that needs to be made easier so that if an enterprise doesn't work, you can quickly shut it down and kind of move forward. So uh, in that sense, uh, I thought it was progressive. And uh, I, yeah, I think on, on, on ATD stuff, nothing big, big bank, uh, nothing interesting. Uh, uh, I, I don't think we're uh, saving more tax anytime soon. Uh, if at all, some of the crypto holders are going to be paying more tax, but uh, at least it's being recognized. And, and that, 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 that was, I think that, that, that seemed quite interesting that the government, when you're taxing something, you're at least recognizing it. So uh, that was quite interesting as well. That's a good uh, point. <laughs> yeah, go on, Sarah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Bhavjut, and thank you, Nikhil, for joining us today. We'll move. Uh, we'll uh, move on with our other uh, uh, other speakers today. Thank you for joining us, and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. So, uh, we're joined by uh, Sandeep uh, Sandeep Agarwal from uh, Doom. Uh, Sandeep is here, I guess. Yes. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, Sandeep. How are you? Hi. Good. Hi, Ritu. Hi, Sandeep. How are you? Good, good, good. So, Sandeep, uh, you were expecting, you know, that EVs uh, should be promoted and they should get I read one of your uh, pre-budget quotes, and uh, you were expecting that this uh, sector should be given some uh, impetus. And also, uh, apart from that, the in- overall infrastructure infrastructure uh, push when it comes to roads, it helps your business. So, what's your what's your take? Uh, absolutely, Saurabh. So, you know, government had a, a, a clear call out in this budget, uh, uh, primarily linked to the EV and a, as it relates to public transportation. So there's a, a battery swapping policy, which they have announced as part of the budget. Uh, budget. This will, in our view, encourage the adoption of electric vehicle when it comes to public transportation. Then, you know, uh, we are talking about um, 10.7 lakh crore rupees in capex by government and particularly they called out 25000 kilometer new national highway um, and you know um, while we do often complain about you know traffic a lot of congestion on the roads but reality is india is among you know while it is our fifth largest automobile market in the world it is um, you know 60th plus when it comes to per capita automobile availability so the investment in infrastructure especially in highway will obviously increase the adoption of automobile uh, we wanted to we wanted to see more measures for the automobile industry but if i see the glass half full i would still say that you know government has been making easing out automobile industry policies as it is for the last 6 months or one year if you recall, there was a scrape policy which was announced in line with the global peers, uh, et cetera. So, so in, in all, I mean, you know, I think uh, it's still good. Uh, yet it looks like expansionary policy, which is one of the big factors, which in general increases the adoption of automobile and one or two special call out for electric vehicles. So, Sandeep, just a follow-up question. So, your, I know you sell newer cars also, but majority of your cars are old cars. So, now that we move towards EV and if there is a push towards EV, will we see Room and other other such platforms uh, uh, take? Uh, what do we, what do you do with the inventory of the old cars that you have? Because if it pushes towards EV, it will take time. I know, but still, ten years, fifteen years, maybe. Yeah. So, I think Saurabh, then your question, I would take in like a two part. One is in terms of uh, electric vehicle getting sold online. Yes, you're right. I mean, Droom and many other platforms are primarily uh, used uh, automobile. But our view is that 
electric vehicle, you know, even the like Elon Musk, he does not call, call his car a car. He call it more like a software or more like, you know, it is no different than a smartphone. And if you think about it, including the Chinese OEMs, smartphone industry has achieved tremendous growth by selling it uh, through online. Uh, you know, when, when Henry Ford invented assembly line, that time having a physical dealership for a new automobile made so much sense. But with electric vehicle, uh, we expect this category, the new vehicle will see much larger adoption online. So that is one part of your question. So we think that will continue to happen. And we do actually already have seen in last two years, the largest selection of EV vehicle making it to our platform. Uh, and especially we don't have physical stores, so there's no conflict of interest with the dealers. Uh, second part is, uh, you know, the while EV, EV may be growing, let, let's say every 100 vehicles sold in India for the next one decade to your point, sort of, uh, you know, maybe larger percentage will be electric vehicle. But still, you know, US has been pushing electric vehicle since 99, since 2000, or almost since the Iraq war. Right, there were hybrid vehicle, then you know, and so on. Still, you know, uh, it is not even uh, in a double digit in terms of the total vehicle. Right, in a new vehicle sale, maybe it is higher. So I think it will take time, and especially the cost of capital, um, cost of capital and real estate is so much more expensive in India. I think it will take a while for EV to really take over in terms of number of units sold higher than the combustible engines. I take your point, but I will like to point out that there are there are some things called lobby, you know, the oil lobby and all that would also not allow EVs to come up that fast. If you're that's right, that. yeah, yeah, it's a, absolutely. I mean, you know, and auto. Sorry, just I just like to add quickly. Uh, you know, we don't realize it, but automobile actually account for fifty one percent of total manufacturing industry of India. So yeah. it's a very very large industry, right? And uh, you know, absolutely, EV has a very compelling value proposition, and we are all in favor of it. But you cannot be, uh, you know, the reality of the country in terms of how much depends is there in the legacy industry. That right? what is the cost of capital and a unique structural constraint of India. Uh, in our view, it will take a while for for the adoption starting to look like more industrialized country. Okay. So much, uh, Sandeep. Before we let you go, one final thought on the overall uh, scheme of things that you heard in the uh, start, uh, about the startup ecosystem uh, in the budget. Was it enough, or were you expecting more? Uh, see, I think. Uh, look, I think it was enough. You know, uh, I mean, we we are inch wide, uh, mile deep into the startup ecosystem, so we want to see the budget to be fully re fully reflection of that. But uh, 1.3 billion people uh, who have not touched the startup ecosystem yet, so. I would say overall, a country talking. Second, we are talking about nine, you know, at a finance minister level, reiterating nine, nine percent and change GDP growth, which is great. Uh, the capital gain coming from, let's say, if I, if I sell my equity or stay shareholder sell their equity, the surcharge getting limited to 15% versus it could be as high as 26% in the past, uh, that is good. Uh, I know a previous speaker before me uh, mentioning about, uh, you know, government recognizing the role of VC and PE and many other things. Uh, you know, this, is, this has been uh, almost a half decade of very encouraging uh, body language and posturing uh, from the government side. So, you know, um, uh, and beyond that, I would say the best thing government can do is really let us do our part uh, and kind of stay away when you start bringing too many policies, the innovation can take, uh, you know, uh, innovation can take some time backseat. So I think uh, in my view, it was, you know, it was really, I think it was quite balanced. Uh, thank you, Sandeep, for joining us today and hope to see sure. you again thank in you. our future uh, webinars. Thank you so much. Uh, Ritu, over to you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Sandeep. Um, those were wonderful views. And uh, surely, I think great things going to happen there in the auto space, um, and particularly the EV space. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ritu. Good to see you. And thank you for having me. You too. Uh, so I'm going to come to Anil Nagar. Anil Nagar has joined us from ADA 24-7. Um, so, you know, a, a great uh, sort of a budget for the tech sector. We see uh, great recognition coming for it. Uh, one channel, uh, one class, one TV channel program, uh, e -vidya, under the e-vidya scheme. 
Um, so the, I think the whole impetus of the government really in the budget is to uh, reskill uh, our population uh, for the digital sort of transformation that's happening very rapidly in the country. And also at the same time, uh, you know, kids who have fallen back in terms of their education, um, the way they were taking their education, how to sort of cover that up. So what are your thoughts on it? You know, what uh, what kind of collaborations particularly I would be very interested in knowing because, you know, as, as, as the pandemic ceases or becomes lesser in its intensity, we'll see children going back to school, uh, students going back to colleges, universities. So given all of that, um, how do you see a, a more collaborative working between edtech and the formal education sector coming to happen so that the larger goal of, uh, you know, amplifying education in the country is achieved? Yeah. So, uh... Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that uh, uh, by mentioning these few steps, which you just mentioned, uh, uh, which is about digital university and uh, opening uh, new channels, I think one of the most important thing which government has done is uh, recognized uh, in a way that our kids have suffered quite a lot in the last two years. And uh, uh, we, while uh, as an education company, we look at the complete spectrum of uh, uh, strata, economic strata, as well as uh, demographies. What we realize is that uh, people who come from smaller places, people who are coming from rural areas, uh, their uh, kids have suffered uh, quite a lot. Uh, situation is actually very bad. And uh, uh, so we, for example, we as a digital uh, education company, we, we think of various solutions, how we can uh, uh, take education to those places, how we can make more affordable, maybe we can make free for the time being. But there are challenges uh, there. Uh, and uh, while government has announced a few steps, but I, I still feel that uh, there are areas where a uh, lot of more work uh, is required to be done. Uh, for example, one of the area which we, we identify and we clearly see that, uh, which is coming as, as a blocker for our uh, uh, kids who are coming from rural areas in terms of access to quality education is the device thing. What we have seen is that uh, mostly these guys access education through mobile and uh, in rural areas, either there is no mobile or there is one mobile, which is mostly with the parent, father or mother. So how any anybody uh, in the family, how a kid is going to access education, even if we uh, think of providing that education for free. And now when government is saying that we are uh, thinking of a digital university and uh, we are thinking of multi multiple uh, channels, uh, so, uh, so I think that this is one area which I, I found slightly missing in the whole uh, scheme of things. Uh, government should have uh, come up there uh, with some kind of a scheme or some kind of uh, facility so that these guys uh, can have some device through which they can access education. And, and uh, uh, frankly, uh, this, is, this is the feeling all of us have at 24-7 that these kids have really suffered uh, in last two years. Almost, uh, it has been like uh, in normal course, if you, you let's say you're learning 100 things, they've hardly uh, learned 10 to 20 things only in, in, in these two years. So that's one, uh, but good thing is about the uh, channel part, I will say where government is thinking of uh, coming up with multiple channels. What we have seen is that in many cases, uh, uh, people still have TVs at home and where uh, this education becomes relatively accessible. So, uh, so I will say this is one, one commendable uh, gesture, but yeah, ultimately implementation matters and fingers crossed for that. Yeah, and of course then, you know, the government is also planning to set up uh, digital universities, uh, uh, which is to be done in collaboration with a lot of other uh, existing educational institutions. Uh, do you also see, uh, I know, and I mean, AICT ha uh, e has been given more power and uh, recently we know that they were sort of trying to bring a demarcation between edtech startups and educational institutions. So largely, where do you think the whole play for education is gonna be, you know, where, what space is edtech gonna take up in the future? Um, you know, as I said, once the pandemic ceases and uh, people go back to schools to their formal education. So what, how, how is the play going to change a bit um, in 22? So I think this is, this is the future. This is the right direction. Digital university is definitely the future. Because when we uh, we are uh, thinking of a university, we are thinking of grown-ups, people who are in the age group of let's say 17 plus or 18 plus, and where uh, this device thing is not a challenge. And uh, what we have seen is that in terms of learning, in terms of getting the world-class education, digital 
can digital is the only medium which can bridge that gap. So before digital era, we were very dependent on local things and local pedagogy and teachers and all. But now uh, this digital thought process, thinking of uh, bringing uh, uh, education at a global level, like some something for example nowadays you can see that even uh, universities like Harvard or Stanford or Oxford, uh, all of them are even available uh, on various digital platforms. So this is this is going to revolutionize the way we learn and the way we imbibe education. Uh, and uh, while we were talking of uh, the collaboration, I think this has to be a collaborative approach. What I have seen in my past uh, experience uh, in education in the last six, seven years, that uh, entrepreneurs are more, uh, 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 or entrepreneurship probably is the right uh, way to execute things rather than being dependent on government machinery for operations or uh, operational execution. Uh, giving, uh, uh, making our laws, making our, uh, uh, systems flexible to that and open to uh, 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 participation of entrepreneurs in the whole ecosystem. That that that's going to be helpful. But I think uh, given the freedom and uh, given the dire right direction to entrepreneurs in the country, uh, they they are capable to uh, execute and revolutionize the whole space. Totally. Thank you very much, Anil. And I mean, I'm certainly looking for great guns, uh, things to happen in the education sector. And of course, I think, you know, it's it's the bottom line, it's the foundation of virtually everything that happens in the country, uh, whether it's entrepreneurship or whether it is, uh, you know, professionalism. So I think it's all kudos to education sector and particularly ed tech uh, sort of leading the bandwagon there. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, Yignesh, I'm going to ask you um, this, you know, we've seen so many new sectors being given impetus to uh, in the in the budget, whether it is EV, whether it is ed tech, um, you know, uh, I mean, in particularly uh, the ed tech, what we've seen, I've never seen so much impetus being given before. Um, and you know, and crypto. I mean, that that was totally that totally came out of a that was a surprising situation. I didn't even think they mentioned crypto in a budget. Otherwise, let alone the budget. So it's it's good to see you know government sort of recognizing that. Um, so how how do you think it's going to pan out uh, the new sectors, particularly with the government in Peters, um, in the times to come, maybe in the six months? What do you see changing? Yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting discussion, uh, Ritu, uh, you know, because we we deal with these very new startups. So we get these whole, you know, dynamic disruptive founders bringing to the fore. And uh, precisely the reason why there's been so much buzz around crypto and confusions that government felt it that probably the best attention on this can be in the budget. And uh, though we all knew that, you know, the bans on the crypto would never come. Uh, this is a good way of saying, fine, you know, we'll start taxing you at 30%, which is fair. Nobody is going to really object to that. Uh, that kind of steers clear sort of confusion in the market, right? And then now, uh, because there are very large exchanges, India's youth is getting involved with the whole crypto space and more is going to happen, right? We are slightly behind the advanced countries in that respect. And this is probably the only way more and more people can come to the force. I think I see it as a, to me, it was expected. Uh, we were looking at some announcement before the budget as well, but I think the government did well to kind of bring it up right on the budget day to obviously yeah. set at rest a lot of concerns. On the other side, a uh, lot of new sectors we've been seeing, uh, and this would be relevant uh, you know, for a lot of people who are attending now. A uh, lot of new businesses are emerging like, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff happening in the services tech. So if you really see, apart from the core you know, uh, sectors, uh, services sector is obviously uh, taken a little bit of beating, but then I think it will going to bounce back very soon. But we are seeing a lot of innovative stuff happening in the services tech, you know, it's like facilities management and a lot of innovation happening there because India has been an underserved market, even from a services sector perspective, as we know. So as much of innovation uh, that we are seeing, I think services tech uh, in its own category will will see a lot of startups coming up and, uh, you know, Ship Rocket obviously being one of them. Uh, you will see more and more of services tech happening on various sectors. Uh, you know, small, small sub-segments of the D2C and other such uh, trends are, you know, things like pet space. And, you know, these are things that VCs are already funding. It's a very interesting space. You will see large companies uh, coming out of these new businesses. So, uh, and ed tech also, like, you know, even young adults investing within FinTech, 
uh, fintech has got various tentacles right it can just go on and on and on and you could you know see multiple innovative companies uh, we've funded one company in the young adults investing space with parental supervision i think a lot of young adults want to understand investing but uh, they really are uh, clueless about how to do it and more importantly the parents don't really know what their kids are actually doing so you know a platform like this where you could have young adults uh, investing with parental oversight a new concept though in th things like these are coming up in fintech you know uh, young adults are also understanding the importance of savings uh, retirement investing in various forms i think a lot of offshoots businesses are happening there so i think those are some of the schemes and while uh, you know agritech as a sector has seen startups uh, it's a slow thing and it's it's very deep very wide uh, for things to make impact it takes longer gestation periods so you will see that happening but the pace would not probably be the same as uh, other sectors that you've seen so i think that will still take some time but uh, yeah i mean those are the things and of course uh, b2b enterprise saas is something that we've already seeing a lot of innovation happening uh, a very deep tech uh, innovation things like you know user generated content in uh, you know uh, uh, ai uh, voice vernacular etc i think a lot of those trends are very important and you will see government slowly opening up to these and these are still uh, catching the attention of the government so i think but more and more as the startup ecosystem you know we call it the 2.0 now uh, the next decade we will see some of these uh, things getting attention of the government sure thanks so much ignesh and uh, certainly looking forward to some um, uh, great uh, things happening in 2022 post this budget thank you for joining us today we also thank joined you. akshay singhal from log9 um, so akshay of course uh, ev has been the talk of the town and i see special uh, uh, impetus being given to battery swapping uh, policy which of course is very important for the entire ev network to develop at the pace that the government really wants it to happen so what is your outlook on uh, the ev space and particularly with the uh, with the new policies uh, that are announced in the budget how how do you think it's going to get a one up thanks to for having me here in the panel today so uh, no actually the budget was uh, 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 i would say a bit of a delight as compared to previous budgets in that sense it has been very progressive from uh, from the ev uh, ev standpoint and a lot of people were uh, waiting to kind of uh, hear a scenario wherein the battery is actually decoupled from the vehicle while swapping is one uh, uh, way of doing it but what it is what is required is uh, financially decoupling the battery pack from the vehicle it comes as a fixed battery inside the vehicle itself because the real hit of uh, like the real financial hit of buying an ev is actually uh, residing in the higher cost of the battery itself and if you can financially decouple it means of swapping or by any other uh, battery subscription means that is uh, very that is very very important for adoption and uh, while we have our own uh, concerns around swapping as a concept in terms of safety in terms of reliability of the battery packs and the reliability of range and performance towards the customer uh, but uh, decoupling the battery pack financially is very very relevant uh, for for the ecosystem to really grow and that is a welcome move uh, one thing uh, which is also is uh, setting up uh, financing uh, like uh, government enabled financing a blended financing which has come up as a uh, announcement today of uh, uh, climate related activities uh, basically supporting those activities through government enabled financing that is a very welcome step and uh, in general the government has been very proactive towards climate action uh, uh, it, which was also reflected in the cop 26 announcement by the prime minister wherein he said that we will be uh, going towards 500 gigawatt of uh, renewable energy generation in the country as compared to 150 gigawatt that we have today so that all, all of those steps are uh, uh, phenomenal uh, but i would still resonate uh, with uh, hello sorry i think uh, my network was poor for a bit so i was saying that uh, i agree with the point which was raised by one of the other panelists uh, regarding the ease of taxation piece Uh, which is uh, which has been expectation expectation of the overall startup ecosystem uh, around uh, around with the budget uh, over the years at least for the last uh, three four years that I have seen it and the other part was still uh, a lack of announcement or commitment towards 
uh, uh, growing growing R and D across the core industrial sectors. Uh, so while incentives are being given towards adoption, uh, but still we are uh, lacking that push towards local innovation and, and indigenization uh, by means of R and D. So that still remains uh, uh, a point which which we would look forward to having uh, announcements around in the next budget. And how do you think, you know, the adoption can be more um, um, universal uh, for EV adoption um, overall? I mean, you know, because we know that the metro has its own trends and then metros are first to adopt and then it goes to tier one and then tier two. But, you know, instead, and that, that's for, from, a, from a perspective of somebody who is working on the EV side uh, from the EV industry, that's actually a very long haul process. So, you know, any, any special efforts that you think that are happening, which may not have been announced in the budget, or are likely to uh, be announced later at some point of time, which will actually help in a more universal adoption of EV instead of just going, you know, or trying to address it phase by phase uh, for various markets. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at uh, the tier two or tier three towns or uh, like cities or even, even towns after that, right? It is not that intent to go electric is not there. A lot of people really want to uh, adopt EVs. There's a general excitement around electric vehicles. And especially if you look at the low speed two wheeler segment, for example, you will see phenomenal traction that is happening in tier two, tier three towns. And uh, people are uh, right. taking up. I was surprised where there's a small uh, tier two uh, town in uh, Karnataka called Chikmangu, which is also a hill station, right? I was visiting that uh, uh, last month and I was surprised to see around seven or eight uh, two wheeler showrooms on one road itself, like in that town. And these are electric two wheeler showrooms which, were, which have popped up over there. So adoption is happening, intent is there. What will make or break the scenario is that the point is uh, what has happened in the EV case where the TCO already is lower, the cost per kilometer is lower, but the upfront cost has been a barrier. Now, while the government has done already a lot in terms of providing incentives or subsidies to lower down the cost by, uh, based on the battery sizing and all of those things, what is required is that how can we decouple the battery part of it? Because essentially battery is the fuel, right? That is what is driving the vehicle. And if there can be models and there can be support to uh, make it available on a subscription scenario rather than asking the customer to pay for it upfront, because battery is also something in the typical case, although our batteries last for 15 years and beyond. But in the typical case, in general, if you look at the EV scenario, these batteries will not last more than two, two to three years time period. So then the customer will have to go for replacement. Now, barely they have been able to, especially in the, in the last mile, two wheeler, three wheeler kind of space where we are seeing a lot of traction, right? These customers, these drivers who are basically earning a li livelihood by doing customer deliveries, they've barely been able to arrange financing for upfront costs of the vehicle itself. Now, after three years, if you tell them that, boss, you have to invest 40% of the vehicle cost again and buy a new battery back to keep on running the right vehicle in that sense, that is not possible. So subscription makes sense wherein uh, it, they are only paying a monthly fee or per kilometer fee to be able to run the vehicle. And then, they will, then the larger base, larger population will be able to relate to the benefit of EV uh, in the in the in the larger sense, right? Like, uh, how do it come? How does it compare in terms of the cost of petrol per kilometer versus the subscription cost of uh, the battery or the charging cost uh, in a in an EV scenario? And that would really really drive adoption, which requires very uh, sign uh, a significant amount of financial engineering and incentives from the government. So one thing that was missed out again, and it was expected from the EV industry was. Uh, to include electric vehicle financing as the priority lending sector uh, uh, in in the Indian context, so that was that was something which was missed out, and these kind of uh, so to say uh, scenarios coming in will really push for EV adoption. Absolutely, no, I think uh, wonderful thoughts uh, there, uh, Akshay, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this Entrepreneur Twenty Twenty Budget Review. Um, uh, over to you, Saurabh, as we go on and touch other sectors as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ritu. So I'll, I'll, I'll go to Roland. Uh, Roland, uh, no announcement as such for the gaming industry, I know, but uh, is that good as well? Because as one of our speakers was saying that more and more rules when they come in, they make the space more complicated. So uh, let us, uh, and that disrupts innovation. So do you think it's, a, it's good in a way? And what's your overall, uh, overall uh, uh, you know, observation uh, towards what has been announced for the startup ecosystem? Uh, Roland, yeah. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Aurora, for having me. 
Yeah, there are uh, four points that I would like to touch upon. Not uh, as you rightly said, not uh, directly. There are no uh, announcements that you know impact the industry directly. But yeah, uh, first one is the uh, the announcement of the AVGC task force. Now, as you know, AVGC stands for Audiovisual Gaming and uh, Games and Comics. Now, the games uh, that you know come under the AVGC are pertaining to game development, and as we know. Uh, there are in the excess of 300 uh, studios, game studios that develop uh, indigenous games, as well as you know there are large uh, global uh, studios that are uh, developing games in India. So I think that task force uh, will boost uh, the gaming sector as far as game development is concerned. And uh, you know currently uh, it is 10%. India holds 10% of the global AVGC market. but that has potential with this task force you know trying to uh, uh, in place eventually it will give a boost towards uh, you know going towards maybe 18 20% of that global market that was the first uh, thing I, i wanted to say the other uh, point is that uh, they have announced that uh, there will be the auction of 5g uh, in 2022 now what uh, the gaming as a sector will benefit directly because uh with 5g's obviously there will be faster you know data speeds there will be less latency and uh, the entire gaming experience for the consumers is going to uh, be uh, extremely highlighted and and uh, because of that uh, i think uh, the entire experience for gaming and you know the adoption of new technologies that 5g can facilitate uh, with a a ai you know and vr and uh, ar also so all those things would give the consumer a much better experience uh, that was the second point the third thing is that um, you know the extension of uh, uh, for you know tax benefits for these startups uh, and as we know the online skill gaming industry has in the excess of 300 startups uh, you know, because there is no entry barrier so there are so many and some there are also some unicorns but uh, mostly startups you know operating in the space so that i think also would be Uh, a benefit that uh, the gaming startups can can derive from and the fourth uh, point uh, is this uh, the announcement of the uh, this uh, the central bank digital currency the you know the rupee there i feel that you know eventually uh, you know, what will happen is the uh, the micro transactions so you know in the the in app purchases that happen in the gaming uh, you know that's one of the revenue streams as well um, and uh, uh so so you know this uh, the smaller transactions i think would help the overall momentum and i think this would lead to uh the arpus going up you know because we are one of the lowest arpu markets as far as you know gaming spends are concerned close to 150 200 uh <clears throat> and you know, that i think with this uh, launch of the uh, you know digital rupee uh, currency this would uh, give a boost to uh, the gaming sector so these i think four points uh Uh, i think are uh, going to help the overall uh, gaming industry and uh, the icing on the cake obviously would be that avgc can be expanded somehow to include the uh, you know the online skill gaming even the transactional side and then i think uh, that would be uh, uh, that would be the you know the uh, the ask of the industry but uh, these were the points that i wanted to highlight thanks sir Yeah, great, great points, Rohan. So, so I think, but step in the right direction. I just said that if AVC can be expanded, I mean that. But, but, but these are great strategies. You said 5G. When it comes in, it solves a lot of problems in terms of, uh, you know, not only developers but also we as users, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, as I said, uh, you know, uh, as of now, uh, if you look at the uh, the online skill gaming side, and if you don't look at the, you know, the very immersive type of games. which are also equally uh, uh, you know consumers are lapping it up even on their uh, handheld devices so and this is happening in the you know 3g 4g uh, uh, scenario now imagine if there is you know the 5g in place uh, after the, the the financial year 22 23 then is going to be a game changer uh, uh, for the entire user experience and that i think would lead to a lot of you know this entire thing about and then add to that the uh, digital currency so this transactions and if you look at the revenue streams uh, which are you know mostly the large part 75 to 80% is the pay to play formats uh, or subscription led uh, that obviously you know is growing at uh, in the excess of 20% uh, cagr year on year 
then if you look at the you know the in app as i said is one of the low low markets but india is also the second largest down download market in the world but that that entire thing you know would would give this entire value chain a huge fillet so so 5g coming in and then you know you have the digital currency uh the the in app side of things the revenue coming in from in apps and also the ad driven revenues i think would you know uh, go up significantly uh, thank you so much uh, rodin for joining us here and giving really perspective which i also didn't have i didn't have thought about uh, you know that how giving can benefit from the other announcements indirect announcements that have been made so thank you for joining us today hope to see you again welcome in our future of web webinars uh, pranav i'll come to you next uh, yours uh, you know the hospitality i mean we have we heard earlier also that there is a provision of another 50000 crore which will go to the msb so kind of will help it but is that enough so uh, uh, firstly uh, thank you for having me, having me on the panel sort of uh, as we all know i think travel and hospitality industry has been one of the worst uh, hit industry in in terms of the pandemic uh, coming up uh, in the world uh, but then yes uh, this 50000 crore extension in the eclg scheme uh, will definitely help the small operators uh, as we understood that the market has seen a lot of uh, players opting out of the hospitality industry i think around two out of five uh, hotels small hotels in, in in the country got shut because of covid and this particular scheme should definitely help but then Uh, uh i mean to be really honest uh, the industry really expected uh, a few more things to be there in the budget for example uh, the, the 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 tax uh, scheme is such that uh, i mean uh, below 1000 rupees there are no taxes and and the, the industry really expected it to be increased to 2000 rupees so that uh, the supply i mean the demand was always uh, going to be there and and Uh, as we understand i think around 35% of the industry uh, sells below 2000 rupees and 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 a little extension on that particular tax structure would have uh, would have helped uh, uh, creating demand but then uh, i mean uh, as you know i mean the travel and hospitality industry has always been uh, there in the market uh, fighting the pandemic and and I feel that uh, uh, a few things uh, in this budget has also uh, been positive for us i think uh, i mean uh, for a strong base and foundation uh, uh, the the eclg scheme extension uh, would definitely give a boost to the entire uh, industry no but but do you think that you know that the reason could be that as you said that the industry mostly 35% as you said mm -hmm. operates below 2000 rupees and mm -hmm. that would have been a A, a huge amount of tax so that the government would let go possibly and we are at a time when we need uh, more tax collection so do you think that could have been been there but any other way it could have been compensated for no so uh, what i think is uh, i think the only 35% of the industry is below uh, 2000 rupee uh, average daily rates uh, the first and foremost uh, priority for any government and especially the industry is to get those occupancies higher up to the level which were pre covid uh, and and i think the remaining industry uh, sells well above uh, the price segment and and uh, the priority is to save a lot of uh, jobs which are, which are created uh, uh, through small hotels uh, the keys i mean uh, a key where the the sizes are below 25 keys uh, i think those uh, are uh, some of that uh, particular segment where Uh, a lot of job generation also happens, uh, and and uh, because of uh, because of tax saving, I think the customer demand would have been retained. Uh, 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 jobs could have been maintained, and all all those things uh, could have benefited. Uh, firstly, the industry, and as well as I mean the entire sector uh, and, and the government as well. So uh, I feel I think uh, that if we do not look at it from the point of view of tax losses to the government and probably look at it from the point of view that the industry could be benefited i think that could have been the priority at this moment yeah, yeah. all right thank you for joining us i know the hospitality sector was expecting a lot more and uh, the budget seems to be a little short in promises for the hospitality 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 sector
Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we'll move to uh, Madhushudan. Madhushan, thank you for being patient and uh, waiting your turn. Uh, uh, Madhushan is from Credit B. So, uh, Madhu, first your reaction. I mean, there are small little bits which I will I want to talk about uh, the pay the payment uh, and the entire fin fintech sector. But what's your first reaction? Because in the very beginning of the of, of the budget speech, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the finance minister said that promoting digital economy and fintech technology enabled development, energy transition, and climate action will be one of the focus areas. Yeah, definitely, uh, 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 Saurabh. Thanks, thanks for having me here. And and uh, uh, it was kind of a you know uh, it was kind of a welcome move in in certain indications, uh, right? So one is um, what we saw at least specific to the startup and the the, the fintech space. Uh, if we are considering. Uh, one was uh, the announcement on the, the the cryptocurrency. I mean, the budget session. I mean, having an announcement towards crypto and then trying to tax it at uh, uh, thirty percent uh, on on any kind of a gains uh, was was kind of a little bit was I was taken by the surprise because I thought like it would be part of certain bill, but um, FM kind of announcing it uh, gave an indication of the acknowledgement of that entire asset, uh, right? So it's it's a very growing asset with almost I don't know ten lakh plus, ten crore plus uh, investors who are there, and therefore this was acknowledged very well by the government. Um, but if you look at the tax regime, what has been uh, levied on it, I think it's it's a kind of a lot of deviation there um, with with the, what we have seen. As in, like there is uh, the LTCGs that you know uh, could have been at a lower level, um, and also the losses should have been allowed to kind of carry forward, which happens in the the equity market or any kind of other investment market, including the housing and whatnot. Um, but I think I think those has been kind of curtailed, and and it's a flat. Uh, thirty percent on on any kind of a gains. Um, so it's 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 in a way that you know what is it's a large deviation. So uh, it it at, uh, at one point it shows that there is an acknowledgement from the government, and we could very much see there is some kind of a crypto bill which will uh, which might uh, uh, accommodate the the private cryptocurrencies in some form or the other is is a one indication what I kind of take away from that. The the second thing is um, they're also not too happy about it because the taxation is uh, kind of little. Uh, harsh on that particular asset, and therefore the the encouragement to uh, uh, the, the the individual investors to invest more um, is is not on par with how would they would have encouraged in, in case if that really kind of acknowledged it with a full heart. Uh, so that's that's one thing. But but all in all, it's a first step. Uh, at least at least the, the the crypto investors should be somewhere happy that you know how things are going to be faring uh, in the in the upcoming year. The second thing was, um, uh, you know, when we looked at their other announcement about uh, the digital currency, what they're going to launch, the RBA backed digital currency, and also there's a 75 uh, digital units, uh, which they want to set it across 75 different districts. Uh, so it's, it's all kind of going, uh, uh, giving a lot of acknowledgement from the government about this growing, astronomically growing fintech world, and also the, uh, you know, the, the kind of revolution or evolution, what what these fintechs are bringing to the way the, the payments are done, where the banking is done, where the lending is done. Um, so I think somewhere government also wants to be part of such um, uh, such initiatives what the people also have kind of participated very actively. And, and those um, uh, initiatives, also part of the Digital India campaign, what, what they had announced earlier, it seems like a progress of that uh, Digital India campaign. Um, uh, so so there, is, there is an indication that the people are evolving to kind of or, or accepting such uh, digital way of doing the banking heavily and therefore the the budget also kind of uh, takes notes of that and announces around that right so uh, that's the second thing on the fintech or the the digitization but uh, overall startups may there was uh, there was one announcement regarding this uh, the tax break uh, right so earlier it was like the startups which are kind of uh, incorporated uh, till last financial year uh, were able to get this uh, tax break or uh, uh, till for for three years in the next ten years of operations or so, I think that has been given an extension for one more year. Um, I think that's that's a very good indicative of you know startups play a major role in terms of job creation and also inviting a billions of dollars as investment to the country, and and therefore they want to give a boost to such uh, uh, initiatives. So therefore they have extended uh, the, the tax break for companies which are getting incorporated in this financial year as well. So all in all, I feel that uh, you know there's a lot of acknowledgement and and, and a positive indications towards um, uh, startups and the way the the fintechs are kind of evolutioning the or revolutioning this particular uh, uh, banking space. Yeah, India is a, is a huge country with so many people, <laughs> so we have a long way to go in terms of fintech. Uh, so you know, so finally, uh, final question: anything that you thought would be there and wasn't there, and you expected, you know, could have been there 
to maybe uh, to maybe spur growth of fintech even faster i guess uh, you know the uh, uh, i think the, the the regulation is 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 a major uh, one of the, the the key things for fintech evolution so um, of course you know that's that's not part of the the budget but overall what i would say as an initiative that the government should take is um, uh, the the regulation uh, which has to come in keeps a lot of times a new industries on on kind of an uh, a, a surprise mode or an ex- anticipation mode i mean a lot of uh, different things people are anticipating for years isme kya hoga i mean whether this industry is going to grow or not um, so some indications and some responses Uh, at a little bit of a faster pace makes uh, the the entire uh, uh, mood to settle down in these industries and also helps this pe or vc uh, community also kind of bank on or invest on such uh, industries uh, in, a, in a much uh, earlier fashion or or you know it should give an indication earlier it's this is a no go uh, the government and the, the the regulator doesn't want it so therefore you know there can be a kind of a mood set and then uh, need not to kind of progress but overall uh, the anticipation period Uh, of 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 regulations to come in not come in uh, that that particular phase has to kind of further reduce which will greatly help for all this uh, uh, new economies or the new uh, fintechs that are kind of uh, coming up uh, the second thing was i am i am purely a lender uh, right so we are a lending platform um, and with a, with a nbfc within the um, uh, in house and has a lot of operations on the nbfc so uh, uh, further liquidity uh, to to kind of support because it was not just the wave 1 there was a wave 2 plus um uh, wave 3 uh, god's grace that it's kind of uh, or already kind of timidating down but um uh, any liquidity uh, uh, measures would have further boosted uh, this particular digital lending and and, and digital economy uh, but all in all i think i think it's 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 uh, uh, it's li- it really a fair thing what what they have announced uh, so th- these are the two key anticipations what i have uh, to fuel the growth of the fintechs yeah Thank you, thank you, Madhu, for joining us here today and uh, for sharing your view. Uh, we hope to see you again in our future webinars. So thank you for taking. Thank you, thank you, thank you Sarov. Thanks, thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. So, uh, so Ritu, overall, I think uh, what we've seen that it's kind of a mixed bag. I, I think the hospitality sector uh, uh, has is not really happy about it, but uh, uh, you know, maybe agriculture is uh, agriculture is uh, thriving. Healthcare again is not uh, uh, is not very happy. So, uh, your final thoughts before we wrap up. No, I think um, it's a budget which is walking on tight ropes. I feel you know it's uh, tried to benefit a lot of sectors, but of course you know you have to give it to the government. They themselves have been fighting a pandemic. They've been spending huge amount of money on healthcare in general, and therefore you know uh, right now if uh, you know we were expecting a government to sort of uh, be distributing or gifting money to a lot of sectors, that was not anticipated. But I feel um, overall from what they have done, particularly to boost the startup sector, where they see a lot of funding coming, which is a sector which doesn't rely on the government or doesn't rely upon uh, subsidies uh, to sort of see them through. Uh, so it's a sector that's sort of going out there and uh, uh, you know pushing the ball and trying to do a lot of new things, experimenting and in in turn helping the economy and the country and changing the way um, things happen around us. So I think government is all for it and probably uh, it's it's a kind of a budget which um, will probably see its impact more in the long run. um maybe in two or three years we will be able to really see uh, the budget allocations that were made how they're going to uh, be fruiting out and how they're going to sort of give uh, their due to various sectors uh, that have been picked up ev is something i'm very gung ho about and i feel uh, it's only a matter of time before a lot of uh, us all of us adopt uh, move from combustion engines to ev vehicles uh, and i think government wants us to do that too um similarly it's for edtech and healthcare um the idea is to uh, you know as um, uh, nirmala ji was saying in the morning the idea is less government more governance and this this budget sort of talks about that in a big way and overall i think it's a good budget uh, given the circumstances and the times that we're living in and uh, hopefully will only help the economy to see a bigger boost Thank you so much, and thank you to all our listeners to join us today. And as we said, that uh, it's a, a budget which will take a long time to uh, uh, show its effect. And uh, uh, budgets also, you know, budget documents also take a lot of time uh, to be decoded. So over the next three, you know, two three weeks, we'll be decoding more stuff which will come out for uh, other sectors, and we'll keep updating you 